So, I promised in the lecture that I would provide an online video where I go through the GLS stuff as there's a little bit of algebra involved and um, I don't want to miss you out on the beautiful bits. So, here we go. And we talked about heteroscedasticity where we said there are two consequences. If we use OLS, uh, let's put that in uh, here. So, if uh, we use OLS, then the usual estimator for the variance of beta hat, and that was this guy, sigma square x from x inverse is invalid. Invalid. And if we want to use inference with OLS estimators, we need to use need to use light standard errors. Okay, oh, we talked about that. So that was one consequence. The second consequence was that if you have heteroscedasticity, then the uh, OLS estimators uh, were not blue any longer. Okay, so these guys were not blue. They were not the best linear unbiased estimators anymore. So, um, so that begs the question, is there another estimator, okay? So is there any other, is there an estimator beta which has smaller variance? And the answer is going to be, the answer to this question is going to be yes. Okay, and I'll show you how. Now, before we do that, we need a little bit of algebra. So, in particular, what we need is the following. For any symmetric, to LM, right, symmetric and positive definite matrix, such as our variance covariance matrix that by definition is symmetric and positive definite. Okay. Such as omega, you can find another matrix, in particular a non singular matrix. Singular matrix P such that the following is valid. Okay, and what do we have here? We have our omega, so that will later, this guy will be equal to the variance of our variance covariance matrix of our error terms. That is n by n if you have n observations. Okay, so I'll have n observations, so that is then n by n, and we can find a matrix P such that P times P prime is equal to omega. Now this is a little bit like the square root for a matrix. Okay, for a scalar, the square root, if we multiply the square root with itself, we get the original value. So this is a little bit like the square root matrix. Now from here it follows, so from this, it follows that the following line is true. Now, how do we get there? We will pre-multiply and post-multiply equation 93. So we'll um, pre-multiply, I don't know, pre-multiply with P inverse and we post multiply with p prime inverse. Okay, so if you pre multiply with p inverse, we put a p inverse here and p inverse times p is the identity matrix and we put the p inverse in front here. And then we also post multiply with p prime inverse. So we get a p prime inverse after the omega 
And here we have P prime times P prime inverse, and that's the identity matrix again. So we'll here actually have we have two times the identity matrix, but that's the same. Adam, identity matrix is idempotent, so that's the same as one identity matrix. And on the left hand side we have this uh, this guy. So this is just a little result. I'll just put that in uh, in green. Okay, this is a little algebra result that at this stage has no econometric meaning, but we will need it later to do something quite clever. So now let's recall the original model we are working with. Original model. So that's where dependent variable y, a matrix with explanatory variables x, uh, a parameter vector beta at a narrow term u, and we know that the variance covariance matrix for u is omega, but it is heteroscedastic. Heteroscedastic, that means that we can't simplify it to uh, sigma squared times the identity matrix. Our OLS estimator. is this guy, beta hat, x prime is inverse x prime by, this is the formula you know in your sleep, and we know that if we have heteroscedastic error terms, then the variance for that estimator has this long form, okay? Not the simple form up here, that is incorrect, it has this long form, and includes this omega, um, you know, we use this form to eventually get the wide standard errors. So, the task we're going to set ourselves now is twofold. So what we want to achieve. So uh, be before we continue this, so the problem is we have heteroscedasticity means one of the Gauss Markov assumptions is preached. That means we cannot establish that this guy is blue. Okay, so this is a problem. What we now want to achieve. So here's our task. Transform the model, transform 95 such that, and now two things, A, it still contains our original parameters, contains alpha and beta as linear, actually, parameters. And second, or B, such that it has error terms error terms that are homoscedastic. Homoscedastic. So basically we want to recreate a model that still has the relevant parameters but meets the Gauss Markov assumptions because then we know we can apply OLS to that transformed model and get parameters for our alpha and beta. So to see how we get there, we'll again first do a little uh, revision of some, uh, some stats. Let's put this here. We should keep in mind what we want to achieve. Okay, some, so we will say, I'll put that in green again. So we'll say, we'll do some stats revision already in mind with our model. So we have in our model error terms that are uh, called U and they have a variance covariance matrix of omega. And let's just say for simplicity here. Uh, that they are also normally distributed. Now, recall, okay, so now assume that we create a 
scaled version. Of u. So we do that here. So we and we call that v. Okay. So that's a new error term, and that new error term is the old error term u, pre-multiplied with p inverse. So what happens if we pre-multiply with p inverse? Let's just have a little reminder of what happens to scalar random variables regarding scalar random variables. If you have a random variable, let's uh, call that um, A, and A is normally distributed with mean mu and variance sigma squared. And let's assume that C is a constant. If you then calculate C times A, how is this guy distributed? So this guy is still going to be normally distributed. What happens to uh, uh, the mean? Well, that factor C will just come in front of the mean. And what about the variance? That factor C comes into the variance, but in its squared version. So the new variance is going to be C squared times sigma squared. So this is a little reminder of what happens for scalar random variables. And basically, here we now have a vector of random variables. Something extremely similar will happen. So, because here, this guy is the equivalent of this, okay, with the u being uh, the random variable, which is a here, and the p inverse being that factor, which was the c here. Now we don't have a scalar factor, we have a matrix. So that new term v is still going to be normally distributed because the u is normally distributed. Now what about the, uh, the mean? Well, the mean is going to be p inverse times the mean of the u. The mean of the mu the expected value of the mu, I should say, is actually zero. So p inverse times zero is still going to be zero. What about the variance? Now we know we have to sort of square guys in matrix algebra squaring is achieved by pre and post multiplying with the prime. Okay, so and that's what we get here. Our new variance is the old variance, the omega pre multiplied with our factor p inverse and post multiplied with the factor p inverse prime. So this is our new variance. Now, of course, from the previous slide, we know that this guy here, if we choose, okay, so if p is chosen as proposed, as proposed on a previous slide, uh, as here, as in 93, okay, P is chosen as proposed in 93, then that means that this guy here is equal to the identity matrix. And therefore, V is going to be distributed normally with zero mean and an identity matrix. So importantly, this guy implies what? What is on the diagonal? We have on the diagonal we have ones and zeros everywhere else. Okay. Now we know the diagonal term will give us the variances of the of each element in V, and they are all the same. That means this guy is homoscedastic. Okay, and this is this means we've introduced our crucial trick. So, knowing that pre multiplying u with p inverse will deliver a homoscedastic error term, well, therefore, we will pre multiply the whole model up here, our, our original model. We will pre multiply the whole model 95, of which u is a part 
with P in inverse, hoping that nice things happen. Therefore, the pre-multiply 95 with P inverse. So that's what we do. That's what we do here. And we take a copy. So that's what we have here. We have um, P inverse uh, in front of the left hand side and P inverse in front of the right hand side. The right hand side is a sum. So we have P inverse uh, times X beta plus P inverse times U. Now this guy is different color. This was just our definition of V. Okay. And what will now also do is the following. Here we have P inverse times Y. Let me just get this over here. P inverse times Y. Let's do a little bit of um, dimension accounting. We know Y is N by 1 and P and P inverse therefore is N by N. So what's the whole guy? The whole guy is going to be n by 1. So this is a vector, okay. And what we'll just say is, we'll give this guy a new name. We call it y tilde. And that's what we have here. And then we also have this one here, p inverse times x. Again, a little bit of uh, accounting, p inverse is n by n, x has n rows, and let's say we have k columns, k explanatory variables, then the whole thing is n by k. So it has the same dimension as x, and we'll give this a new name, we just call that x tilde, therefore we have it here. And now, importantly, we have a new regression model. And this now meets our two conditions. Remember what the two conditions were? A, we wanted it to still co uh, contain our parameters. Actually, up here in this model, in model 95, we didn't have any alpha. So let me just uh, erase this. So, uh, actually, actually, eraser. OK, so it still contains beta as a linear parameter vector. So let's see whether that uh, condition is met. And yes, indeed, we still have our parameter vector beta here and here, and it's still in linear form. And second, we wanted to, have to make sure that it has error terms that are homoscedastic. Well, our new error term is our V, and we know that the variance of V is equal to the identity matrix. We've established that up here. So this model meets our requirements A and B. Perfect. Okay. So here is the trick. We have two, we have new variables, a new dependent variable, Y tilde, a new set of explanatory variables x tilde. If we run a regression of y tilde on x tilde, the coefficient vector is still beta. Now we can estimate this. This meets the Gauss-Markov assumptions. And hence, estimating beta by OLS in 102 will deliver a blue beta hat. Okay, so that means blue beta hat in 102 is, 
it is an efficient estimator okay so this is efficient so now importantly two things so we, we have two models here we have models 95 and models 102 they are not the same okay we are having different variables here they are not the same however it turns out that the coefficient in each models is the same okay so the coefficient beta in 95 is the same as the coefficient beta in 102 and we know that beta hat OLS in 102 is blue so if we can if we can use 102 to get a blue estimate of beta well we don't need another estimate of beta in 95 because the beta is exactly the same so it means if we have a blue estimate of beta in 102 we actually also have an efficient estimate in 95 we just use this value Okay, we just use this value, but that is not the same as, so perhaps I'll put that here, okay, that is not the same as beta hat OLS from model 95, okay, beta hat OLS from model 102 is unequal to that, and we call this guy, the beta hat OLS from 102, we call that the GLS estimator for model 95. Okay, but we estimate it in model 102. This is now, this is the trick. So, my next slide so what we just established is that OLS applied without any modifications to the new variables okay and that means to y tilde and x tilde is our new estimator here okay so this is this is what we did here the Let's move this a little bit up. Here. So let's do this. We know our OLS formula, okay, that uh, in a normal model it would be x prime x inverse x prime y. Now in our model we apply it to y tilde and x tilde. So it's going to be x tilde prime x tilde inverse x tilde prime y tilde. But now, of course, we have definitions. We have defined, we previously defined what y tilde and x tilde were. So let us just resubstitute these definitions in here. And then what we get is the following. And I'll use some uh, fancy color coding. Now, the easy bit is uh, we have a y tilde here. Okay, And y tilde is the same as p inverse y. So y tilde is here, and that's the same as p inverse y. So that was the easy bit. Then we have an x tilde, and uh, that x tilde is equal to p inverse x. So where's the x tilde here? The x tilde is here. Okay, and that is equal to p inverse x. And then we also have an x tilde prime let me just um, make a little note here 
x tilde prime. Now we know that x tilde is p inverse times x, but then the whole thing prime. Now when we have a prime, we can uh, basically bring this in here by priming both terms. Ah, uh, sorry, and, and of course, uh, not only priming both terms, but we also need to change the order of the two terms. So that is the same as x prime times p inverse prime. And that bit we have here. So we have x prime, that's the same as x prime p inverse prime. And here we have x prime, x tilde prime again, and that's again the same as x prime p inverse prime. Okay, so this, this is exactly the same. And then uh, furthermore, we know from um, early on in this bit that uh, omega is p, p, uh, p prime. And that therefore means that uh, p inverse prime p inverse is the same as omega inverse. So we just get our omega back in in this last line. So this, I'll just put another beta hat GLS. Each of these are expressions for exactly the same thing, just using different, uh, just using different terms. And this is nice because now you see how the beta hat GLS is calculated in relation to the original y in x. Okay, we use the original y in x, which we had in model 95, which is our dependent variable in model 95 and our explanatory variables. But now we are using a new formula, so it's different to old s, and that new formula has this omega inverse sandwiched in here. Now it turns out that you can calculate the variance of this uh, of this guy. Uh, and it turns out this is the result. How do we get this? I really only want to, uh, to hint of how you get there. It's technically exactly the same of how we got the variance for our, our less estimator. Um, let's say we start from this guy, we call it asterisk. What would you do to asterisk to continue to get the, uh, to get the variance of this term? We substitute, we substituted, well, substituted the model, the model for this guy here for y, okay? And our model is still our original model, okay? So this guy here, you would substitute for y, and then you have a term with beta beta hat GLS on the left hand side, then all sorts of terms and importantly you then also have the error term, uh, sorry, the random variable u here, uh, which is our error terms and then everything is going to be driven by the properties of this u as it was for the beta hat or less. So you can, you can try yourself whether you can establish this relationship. Importantly, this is the variance of an efficient estimator. So it will in general be smaller than the variance of beta hat or less. Okay, so that's uh, because it is sufficient. So in general, of course, this estimator here, as I said before, is going to be unequal to beta hat all s, the hat all s, we, uh, we have that here, okay, perhaps I should put a little subscript to here, all s, that was in equation 97, okay, here we go, looking, looking at this um, estimator in 103 in any of its three incarnations, or let's say in, in let's say in the last incarnation here, the asterisk equation. Can we implement this? Let's circle in green everything we have. The y we have, that's fine. The x, that's our explanatory variables, we have, that's fine. What about the omega? 
gamma. We don't have the omega. That's our unknown variance covariance matrix of the error terms. Okay, so we don't we don't have that. So as such, therefore, as omega is unknown or unobserved, this cannot be implemented, cannot be implemented as such. Now that's a rather that's a rather devastating piece of news. I showed you this clever trick, but now we can't use it. But help is at hand. And the help and the help comes in form of uh, this. Okay, the help comes in form of what is called weighted least squares or feasible generalized least squares. Okay, the G stands for generalized least squares. So somehow we need some value for omega, okay, or a value for P. Okay, these were two equivalent expressions. Now we know what the omega generally looks like. Okay, the omega generally looks like this. And now the question is, you know, how do we need to specify P? How do we specify P? Specify P. So why do I say how do we specify P? Well, in practice, you know, we estimate this guy by OLS. We estimate it by OLS on X tilde and Y tilde, but to get X tilde and Y tilde, we need P, because these were our definitions of X tilde and Y tilde. Okay, and we needed a P for that. So that's what we usually do is we need we want to specify a P then we can else estimate y tilde and x tilde. Now, if we know p was something like the square root matrix, and therefore we know that what we really want on p is the standard deviations. If on omega we have the variances on the diagonal, then p needs to be the standard deviation, because if you then calculate uh, what we had uh, earlier, so if that is the case, this is the case, then P times P prime will be equal to omega. So if you want to specify P, we somehow want standard deviations uh, on here. Well, if we knew omega, we could get P, but of course we don't know omega. That's the problem. Now we have two approaches here. The first one is what is called weighted least squares. So in this is for the case, so and, and it will be applicable in some applications. So in some applications. We believe that the variance of ui of the i-th arrow term is proportional to some variable z i. Okay, and again, that z that could be in the regression model, that could actually be an element of the x, but it could also be some other variable. We talked earlier about the case where we had a um, con Consumption, consumption as a function of income, we realize that for larger income, the variance of the error term would most likely be larger. So there we could possibly be making a case that the variance of the error term is somehow proportional to the income. So in that case, that said I could be income. So what we then want to do is, if we think this is a reasonable assumption, then we're gonna put that variable set i on the diagonal of the p because we think it is proportional to the standard deviation. So the set i is not set one, it's not going to be the same as the sigma one, but it's going to be proportional to it. Same as sigma two, going to be proportional to set two. So 
the mistake we make is sort of basically by a more or less constant uh, constant factor. So if we do this, what will happen? So if we do this, we will get the following. Let's look at the definition of y. y oh, sorry, of y tilde. y tilde is defined as p inverse times uh, times y. If p now is this guy, and then the inverse, what is p inverse going to be? p inverse is going to be 1 over z1, 1 over z2, all the way to 1 over zn, and we'll have zeros everywhere, everywhere else. Now the inverse of a diagonal matrix will always look like this. It will just be the diagonal elements inverted. Okay, so that's very easy. So if we then calculate p inverse times y, so if you now take this value here and multiply it with y, okay, so maybe that still fit, we adjust, so we have y1, y2, all the way to yn. So if you calculate this guy, what do you get? You get y1 times z1, y2, sorry, y1 divided by z1, y2 divided by z2, and so forth. And this is the result here. Now you can also figure out what result you would get for x tilde. I don't have that, I don't have that here, um, but you can, if our x looks like this, let me just illustrate that. Let's say we have a constant, and then we have x, let's say we have two explanatory variables, x1 and x2. So we have x11, x12, all the way to x1n, and then x21, x22, all the way to x2n. Then x tilde will be p inverse times x, and will turn out this will look like this, 1 over z1, 1 over z2, all the way to 1 over zn, and then we'll have x11 over z1, x12 over z2, all the way to x1n over zn, and then x21 over z1, x22 over z2, and so forth, to x2n over zn. So note that in our new x tilde, actually we don't have a constant anymore. Okay, so this one here was a constant, but this guy here is not a constant. So you just have three explanatory variables, all of them uh, are varying. So from here it is obvious why this technique is called weighted least squares, because we are weighting our observations differently. The first observation, the y1 and all the x's for the first observation are weighted by 1 over z1. The second observation is weighted by 1 over z2 and so forth. So this is why we call this weighted least squares. So and then what you need to do in, uh, in EV, so any other software is you use this as the dependent variable and this, these three variables as the explanatory variables. You estimate this regression, the betas you get are your beta hat GLS. There's a number of things to note here. Let me just Copy in my notes from the lecture slides. Ah, okay. Well, got the end here. Um, just copying that, uh, well, covering that, not a constant. So, firstly, we need to make sure, remember, these sets here, we put them on in order to proxy standard deviations. Okay, we wanted them to proxy these these guys here on the on the diagonal 
and therefore we need to the, the standard deviations they will all be positive and therefore we want all the sets here to be positive okay so that's a that's the first note uh, these sets should be positive of course even if a variable has negative values you can always make them always positive by using exponentials secondly once we get so you know eventually we'll get um, so we obtain the beta hat GLS by regressing y tilde on x tilde so we get this beta hat GLS from this model where we have y tilde as the dependent variable and x tilde as the explanatory variables, but we never wanted to estimate anything else but model 95. This is the model we are interested in. Okay, and that never changed. All the other stuff was just trickery, right, to get a different estimator of beta. So that means once we obtain a beta hat GLS, it is to be interpret, interpreted, interpreted in this original model ninety five. Okay, we never want anything else but this. In this model, the beta may have sensible economic interpretations, like for instance elasticities or semi elasticities. And we are not changing this. We're just finding a different way of getting an estimator for this. And this different way, you know, uses this regression. You can think of this basically as an auxiliary regression, okay, a helper regression. But we are not really interested in itself, just in, you know, this estimate. But we'll interpret it somewhere else. And therefore, you should also not the, the R squared from, from this model, Y tilde on X tilde, you can just ignore. What's important is the R squared in the original model. And certainly you can't compare the two R squareds because they um, refer to different dependent variables and then they are not, uh, not comparable. Okay, this is all I wanted to say to, um, to GLS. So, uh, Finally, I'm going to talk about feasible generalized least squares or short FGLS. The reading here is a few pages in Woolrich, which are excellent, and I recommend that you read these. So let's compare it to weighted least squares. So for weighted least squares, what we presumed was that the variance of phi i was proportional to one variable set i. For feasible GLS, however, we propose that the variance of ui is a more general function. So it could be dependent on zi, xi, mi, actually on anything. So quickly back to weighted least squares. What we did here is with that knowledge that the variance was proportional actual, actually to zi, I said that earlier but not here, we just put these zi's on the diagonal of p and then we applied GLS, okay, all the uh, mechanism in GLS. For feasible generalized least squares, this is not so easy because the variance is proportional to something else, something more complicated. So what we basically need is something like predicted values of the error standard deviation we need on P. Okay, we talked about that in GLS that really what we want on here is standard deviations of the error term. So we want predicted standard deviations. Of course, we don't know them. Okay, We don't have the sigma i's and we have to come up with these values sigma i hat to sigma n hat. That is the task in feasible generalized least squares. Let's remind ourselves of the original model, just a basic linear model. Let's call it hash. And we now proceed with the following steps. First, we estimate the original model by RLS and save the 
estimated residuals in UI had. Almost like for testing, right? And the similarities don't end. We next run an auxiliary type regression with UI hat squared as the dependent variable asset proxies for the error variance. We discussed we discussed that before. And now on the right hand side, well, what we put here depends on what we propose the variance is proportional to. So let's look up here. Here we just said that could be ZI, XI, MI, anything you as the researcher think. So you need to put a little bit of thought into that for the particular example. So we'll put all these variables on the right hand side of that regression. So we propose the variances are linear related to that. If there are other variables, that's what the dot 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 is for. You include that and we have an error term. So you run this auxiliary regression, which is very similar to a Broch Pagan type test, right? Or basically exactly the same type of regression. Third, we use the estimated result from step two to predict values for the dependent variable of that auxiliary regression. Okay. And let's call that, that's uh, a little funny notation, ui hat squared was the dependent variable and we predict values. So we'll put a, another hat on it. So, you know, we use the estimated coefficients from that auxiliary regression, plug them in, plug all our explanatory variables in and we get something that's different to ui hat squared, the predicted value. And so that's predicted residual variances. Of course, not the same as ui hat squared and certainly not the same as sigma i squared, but it's a predicted value for this. And so these predictions are on the basis of whatever variables we stuck onto the right-hand side of our step two regression. Okay, and that depends on the researcher's test. So what we then do is we will be using the square roots of these predicted values. Remember, these are predicted variances, but what we want on P is predicted standard deviation. So we use the square root of these values and we'll label them sigma i hat. And we put these onto the diagonal of P because that's what we wanted on P. Okay, so they go on here onto the diagonal. And once we have these values once basically once we have p then we can calculate y tilde and x tilde and then we apply gls just as we discussed it before 